You know, just I love greeting you guys outside before we uh, get into service together and, and seeing your faces and, and, and welcome you in. And just uh, was reminded by a dear brother in the Lord that as a church, we need to continue to lift up what's going on in our world, what's going on with Israel. And so before we get into the word today, I just, I just want to do that as a body and as a church and just go before the Lord. The Lord already knows what's going on, but we are in a world that is in turmoil and it is biblical and we may be seeing prophecy and scripture un un unfold before our very eyes, but our charge, our charge is to petition God on the behalf of his chosen people. And, and so I want to do that today. Can we do that? Just bow, bow our head, close our eyes. Father, right now, we know that you know better than anybody else what's going on. Lord Jesus, we know that you are, you are in control. There are times, Father, where we look at news channels and we read and we feel like the world is out of control. But Lord, we believe that we still serve. We know that we still serve the God that's sitting on the throne of heaven. And the heavens are your throne and the earth is your footstool. Lord Jesus, you know you know our beginnings from our endings. And Lord, right now, I am praying, Father, that you would, you would allow our world, God, to turn to heaven, turn toward you, Father, and find you and seek your wisdom and seek your reconciliation, God. This is not how you want us to act toward one another. This is not what you want for not just your chosen people, but any people whatsoever, because, Father, you love us with an everlasting love. You love us more than we could ever understand. Lord Jesus, when you look down and see the condition of humanity, I have to think, I have to think, Lord, that you, the thought runs through your mind, I already paid for that. I already handled that on a cross. I already took care of that. Father, not just with what's going on with nations, but in our own households and in our own lives. Father, we have the ability to be forgiven and reconciled unto God. And so, Father, right now, I just pray, Father, that there would be peace. There would be peace and wisdom, Lord, that flows out of that region. I pray, Lord Jesus, that you would challenge us as believers to have a heart to continue to pray for this. Lord, we really do. I do. And I don't do it, in, I, I don't do it as much as I should. But I believe wholeheartedly, Lord, that prayer changes things. That prayer has the ability to move things and shift the atmosphere. And Lord Jesus, we just need to breathe that in and breathe that out and just ask you to, to intervene and move. Lord Jesus, we don't want your hand to shrink back. We don't want, Lord, to be in a world where we don't, don't see the hand of God move. We want to see your hand move. So we're asking, Lord, let your Holy Spirit move. Let your hand move. And Father, I pray that your will would be done. Lord Jesus, that your will would be accomplished. We invite you to do that now. And we invite you in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 You know what? Go ahead and be seated this morning. And let's just open up with a word of prayer if we can. And get ready to get into the word today. We're going to be over in Genesis chapter 3. So let's just pray. Father, thank you for the opportunity to be in your house. Lord, we do always count it a privilege to be here. We count it a privilege to get into your word, to worship together with brothers and sisters in Christ. And Father, just to come before your throne. Lord, we ask right now that you would help us to see in your word our lives. And I pray, Father, that you would help us to make the changes that are necessary, Lord, for us to just walk closer with you. Lord, have your way in this place, in Jesus' name. And all God's people said, amen. amen. If you're doing good, say yeah. yeah. All right, we are glad to have you here this morning at Fusion Madison. And uh, I'm the lead pastor, I'm Pastor Aaron. And if you've not been here before, we are so glad that you're with us this morning. I'm going to ask all of our, our regular Fusion Madison people, would you join me in welcoming any first-time guests we have this morning? <laughs> amen. Amen. We're going to do this all over again here in about an hour. And uh, man, God's doing good things here. I will tell you this before we get into Genesis chapter 3 and into our series. Um, we're getting powerfully close. We're going to be around the $12,000 mark that's come in. We're trying to hit that $15,000 mark uh, to get our basement finished up and get dried up down there and, and have that extra space. And so um, if you haven't and you feel led to give, you can earmark that for a basement project and we'll know exactly where that's to go. That's enough of that. Let's get into Genesis chapter 3 today. I told you last week we were starting a series called Oldies But Goodies. We started off with the Tower of Babel, and I said, Adam and Eve have been so overdone, we're not going to start there. Well, we're going to go there today. <laughs> so we're going to talk about the fall of man in Genesis chapter 3 just a little bit. Uh, but I really want to talk about what they did with what happened to them. And I want to talk a little bit about how the devil works. And uh, I know that, I know that uh, in, in so many churches, the, the, the devil is not really an entity that's preached. Um, and, and, and really, if you look at statistical studies and surveys of the body of Christ, 
There's so many people that don't believe in a literal devil. They believe, in, they believe he's a figurehead of, of evil or bad, but there's not a literal devil. Uh, but the Bible would, would, would suggest otherwise. Not only would it suggest otherwise, it says otherwise. And so I want to start off by reading Genesis chapter 3, starting in verse 1. We're going to go to verse 5. We're going to jump around a little bit, and I promise you we'll have it up on the screen for you. Uh, but it says this. Now the serpent was more crafty than any of the wild animals that the Lord God had made. And he said to the woman, did God really say that you must not eat from any tree in the garden? And the woman said to the serpent, see, this is the problem. Just stop talking to snakes. That's the problem. You start. Yeah, but, so, so, the woman said to the serpent, we may eat fruit from the trees in the garden. But God did say, you must not eat fruit from the tree that is in the middle of the garden. And you must not touch it or you will die okay he said you will not surely die the serpent said to the woman for god knows that when you eat it your eyes will be opened and you will be like god knowing good and evil so god tells them very specifically don't eat of this one particular tree and god in his god in his wisdom and god in his goodness actually tells eve what will happen you will everybody say it with me die you will die now i have to say eve probably didn't know exactly what that looked like because nobody had ever died before but god was basically telling her in a way that she could understand you will expire you will cease to exist you will no longer be with us you will turn back into the dirt that you came from you will die this one tree this this one piece of fruit this whatever it was it, people like to say it was an apple the scripture doesn't say that but but realistically that the, the not not only was the instruction from God but the ramifications for what would happen came from God as well you will die and the devil starts off by saying by saying did God really say and then in the end in verse 4 he says you know what God God knows that you will not surely die he you, you you're going to eat and your eyes are going to be opened and you're going to be like God knowing good and evil and I want to start off by just talking about how the devil works. Now, you might say, how do you know how the devil works out of just a few verses of Scripture? The reality is, is if you follow the devil's work and you read throughout the New Testament and into the temptation of Jesus, and we'll talk about it very, very quickly here, you're going to see the devil kind of repeat himself and do some things even with Jesus that he did with Eve. But the first thing that he says to Eve is, did, did God, you can go ahead and get that. Did God, did God, did God really say, did God really say? Now, none of us in here have actually ever talked to a snake uh, and, and had a conversation with a serpent. And I know that I could never be one of those, one of those old preachers that, that, that dance around with snakes. That's not the church for me. We just know this, you know. It's not, it's not where I would want to be. But she engages and has a conversation with the devil. And the devil sort of starts off by saying, did God really say that? The next verse later, she says, yes, God did say that so she knows what god said she repeated it back to the devil she repeated it back to the serpent yes god did say that we know later on in the text it doesn't matter that she knows for sure that god said that she still ends up eating the fruit of that tree she ends up taking it to adam adam ends up eating the fruit of that tree so even though she had a directive from god himself not a pastor not a suggestion from a leader in the church not a elder not something in their life group it was a directive from god himself even though she heard it from the voice of god himself she still makes the choice and he still makes the choice to go ahead and listen to the serpent and the ser serpent starts off by saying did god really say we might think that we have evolved from then. We might think that we're better than that now. We might think, well, you know what, it's right there in Scripture. But I believe wholeheartedly the devil still, that's still his modus operandi. It's still his M.O. He still causes us to think things like, did God really say that? Now, you might not think that he operates that way in, 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 because you can read it in plain text, right? You've got, you've got the Word of God in black, white, and if you got a good one, in, in some things in red that Jesus said himself. And so you can go straight to the text you got your google machines you can google is that in scripture you, you know but realistically we still even i'd have conversations with my wife all the time there's so many things that we believe from our past that aren't even in the word of god and 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 realistically there's whole doctrine formed around things that aren't really 
really in here. It's church tradition and it's church history, but it really is not found inside of the Word of God. And then there's things that are in the Word of God that are clearly there in the black and white text, Old Testament, New Testament, out of the epistles of Paul, out of the mouth of Jesus, out of the wisdom of Moses, out of, out of, out of declarative statements from God. It's right there. And we'll, you know what, I don't, and here's how we do it. Rather than saying, did God really say, well, I'm not sure that's what God really means. I'm not sure that's what that really means. I'm not sure that's what that text really says. If we go back to the original language and we get into the Greek and the Aramaic and we get into the Hebrew, we're going to find that that's not what God really meant. And oftentimes, oftentimes, if you get into the original language, you'll find the standard was higher than what it was in English, not lesser. You're going to find that you're going to find a more robust explanation of of of, of that text in, in the Koine Greek or in the Hebrew or in the Aramaic. You're going to find that you're going to find that God did really say these things. God did really mean these things. But that's how we war with the devil now. We'll say, you know what? I don't know that that's what God really meant by that. And it's crept into our culture and it's crept into our church. Listen, I know that I know that sometimes we look at the world and we think the world is is going crazy and 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 people are falling and things are getting worse. And the reality is the world's always been heading in that direction. The standard the standard inside of culture has always been a lesser standard than, what, than what's supposed to have been inside of the body of Christ. And so I, don't concern my, I do concern myself with culture because we're supposed to reach and engage culture. We're supposed to seek and save that which was lost. It's the mission statement of Jesus himself and thus the mission statement of the church. But the reality is, is when this pervades and it comes inside of the church and the church begins to capitulate and say, you know what, I'm not sure that that text really meant that. And, and all of a sudden, standard doctrine begins to change and things start to creep into the church that for for centuries have been a standard inside of the church scholars theologians people have studied the text people who have interpreted people who have literally translated the bible this was the standard and now all of a sudden these standards come in and we start asking you know what is that what god is that what god really really meant and the problem is is if god said it don't you think he meant it? Come on, moms and dads. When you look at your kid and you tell them, clean your room, they might not think you mean it, but do you mean it? Can I get an amen? amen. If you don't mean it, don't say it. Say what you mean and mean what you say. You know, I feel like qu quoting Horton, here's who an elephant's word is. No, we're not going to do that. But the reality is you say what you mean. And you mean what you say. And that's how people can take you serious. So God said it, and then he made a point to repeat it. Oftentimes, God, God repeats himself. Scripture repeats itself sometimes. And you'll see, and that's where we form doctrine from, is repeated theology that's found inside of the Bible. If God says it more than once, let your ears perk up. If he says it three or four times, let your ears perk up. If it pervades through the Old and New Testament, it's said 78 times, 112 times in Scripture. I think, I think, that's like trying to get your kids to wash their dishes, right? You say 112 times, you mean it. 112 times, all 112. Load the dishwasher. Don't leave them in the sink, right? God is saying it over and over and over again because they're becomes no excuse over and over again I did that for you um, there becomes no there becomes no excuse at that point in time to say God didn't really say that but that's one of the things that we get is is you know what did God really say that or is that really what God is that really what God meant the still the, the, the devil still attempts to create that question in our in our life now, in Matthew chapter 4, I think, this one is, I think this one is less logical than dealing with Eve the way that he did, but he deals with Jesus so very similarly, and, and realistically in Matthew chapter 4, this is the temptation of Jesus. He says this in verse 5, the devil takes him to the holy city, has him stand on the highest point of the temple, and he says, if you are the son of God, throw yourself down, for it is written, other, in other words, the devil says, I'm going to quote your own word back to you. I'm going to say what, I'm going to say what Scripture already says. And he says, he will command his angels concerning you, and they will lift, up, uh, lift you up in their hands so that you won't strike your foot uh, uh, against a stone. The devil basically is telling Jesus, if that's true, if you really meant that, 
Let's see it happen, big fella. Let's see what you got. I'm calling you out right now. And he, he literally does the same thing to Jesus himself. You know what? If it's true, let's, let's see it happen. Let's see the magic. The devil, the devil still tries to work within our weaknesses. There are areas of your life that are probably pretty fortified. I, I, don't, I don't know if you were like me when you, first got, when you first got saved. There were things that just kind of went away fast. There were some things that was just like, it just wasn't a struggle to get those things out of, out of my life. And those things really, after 20, uh, 25 years of, of walking with the Lord, those things haven't come back. But he has continued in my life to try to throw darts and arrows at the areas that are weaker, the areas where I'm more susceptible, the areas where I'm more likely to fail. That's the area that he continues to hit. And the devil does the exact same thing with Jesus, right? He does the same thing with Eve and Adam. They want to eat. It's pretty. It looks good. I want to taste it. I don't know why he said I can't have it. It looks so good. And he hits them in a weakness because they can see with their eyes it looks good, right? He does the same thing with Jesus in Matthew chapter 4. He says that the, the, the scripture says in verse 1, Jesus was led by the, the Spirit into the desert to be tempted by the devil. After fasting 40 days and 40 nights, the Bible, I, 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 love, I love saying this, the Bible, this is one of the most obvious things in scripture. After 40 days and 40 nights of fasting, the Bible says what? He was hungry. Might have been hangry. What would you be after 40 days? I'm like, I just give up. Life is not worth living. 40 days and 40 nights, he has not eaten and he is hungry. What's the first temptation that comes from the devil himself toward Jesus? If you're the son of God, tell these stones to become bread. Why? Because if Jesus has one weakness in that moment after 40 days and 40 nights, remember, this is God in the flesh. This is, this is the eternal God who has dressed himself and clothed himself in humanity. We know from the end of the story that he bleeds. We know from the end of the story that he is dressed in humanity, that he is able to suffer. So we also know that he clearly has a stomach. We know that he has to eat. We know that Jesus ate in other places in scripture. So after 40 days of not doing that, the very first temptation out of the devil's mouth toward Jesus is, why don't you go ahead and fix yourself something to eat? Do it. Because you can. Do it because you can. That's the way that he still works. Think about when you're tired or, 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 or when you're struggling. What's the, what's the devil get in your ear and, 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 and say? When, when, when you're tired and when you haven't had the ability to rest, does he come and say, you know what, you should, just, you should just take a nap. Maybe get yourself a nice warm cup of milk. Lay down and rest a little bit. You'll be good in the morning. We know that that's what, that's what God did with, I believe it was Elijah in the Old Testament when he didn't want to live his life anymore. He said, dude, you need to rest and you need to eat something because you you're, you're tired and you're hangry. And he said, you just need to, you'll, you'll, have a, you'll, have a better, you'll have a better time in the morning because tired eyes rarely see a bright future. The devil tells you, you got all these reasons to stay awake and stare at the ceiling and all this is going to go bad and things are going to break loose and it's going to be awful and nothing's ever going to be right ever again. And he begins to speak into your life. Sometimes it's your own voice. Sometimes it's him just speaking to you because again, man, I'm going to tell you this. I don't believe a follower of Jesus can be possessed by the devil, but that doesn't mean he can't come try to talk to you. That doesn't mean he can't try to have a conversation with you. That doesn't mean he can't try to get you to see it his way way. In fact, that's exactly what he does with Eve, with Adam, with Jesus. I need you to see this my way. The problem is you don't ever want to see things the devil's way. Things can look like they're going to they're going to break loose. Things can look bad. Things can look like they're bleak. Things can look like you're going to have all kinds of problems and in an instant God can solve a problem that has taken you a lifetime to make. Do you believe that? God can solve a problem. Come on, church. We got to do better. Wake up. God can solve a problem in an instant that took you a lifetime to make. He really can. But realistically, there's times where we feel like there is no way out. There is, there is no other path. And, and sometimes he begins to speak and just says, you know what? The world will be better off. No, it wouldn't. It wouldn't. God put you here with purpose. He put you here with reason. He put you here with a plan. And your assignment is unique to you. The devil still works inside and through our weaknesses. You want to know the great thing is, though? The Bible says in our weaknesses, he is made strong. 
We have two ways to go with our weaknesses. You always have two ways to go with your weaknesses. You can capitulate to the devil or you can give your weakness and turn it over to the Lord. And let him come through for you in ways that you didn't expect. That's your part to play in it. Who do you give your weakness to? Do you give it to the devil or do you give it to the Father? That's your choice. That part, you play that part. Now, how did Adam and Eve <laughs> handle their failure? Man, I just... The one thing I, I, I just get in the Old Testament is I read and I'm like, man, we just have not, in all these years, we just have not come that far with how we handle things, you know. Uh, even talking about the Tower of Babel last week and how they wanted to build the tower and how, 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 they, wanted to, how they wanted to stay put and how they wanted to become a great nation and how they wanted to, to, to almost be like God. We, we still get prideful and arrogant and think we are accomplishing everything that we're accomplishing. And here in Genesis chapter 3, you're going to find we handle things almost exactly the same way that Adam and Eve handle them. Let's start in Genesis chapter 3, starting in verse 6. When the woman saw that the fruit of the tree was good for food and pleasing to the eye and also desirable for gaining wisdom, she took some and she, she ate it. How did she know that the fruit was desirable for gaining wisdom? Did that come from the Lord or did that come from the devil? Sometimes our need to know everything puts us in positions we don't want to be in. She also gave some to her husband who was with her. Uh, the, the, the scripture says husband there, who was with her, and he ate it. And, and, and you know what? I don't blame Eve for that, right? Taste this. Okay. You know, I mean, it's just how it went. Like, it's just like we're still doing that, standing in the kitchen. We're standing over at her shoulder like a vulture. She ain't even got it done. You, can, I, you know, can I lick a spoon? You know, come go up. It got us in all kinds of trouble. She gave some to her husband who was with her and he ate it. Then the eyes of both of them were open and they realized they were naked. So they sewed fig leaves together and made coverings for themselves. Then the man and his wife heard the sound of the Lord God as he was walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And they hid from the Lord among the trees of the garden. And the Lord God called to the man, where are you? And he answered, I, I heard you in the garden and I was afraid because I was naked. So I hid. And he said, who told you that you were naked? You were naked. Do you think God needed to ask that question? You, you know, as soon as Adam said, we were naked, so we hid, God knew they ate that, that fruit. He still asked the question, who told you that you were naked? Have you eaten from the tree that I commanded you not to eat from? Was God asking that question because he didn't know? Or was he giving Adam the opportunity to confess? I believe he was giving Adam the opportunity to confess. And what does Adam say next? <laughs> the man said, the woman <laughs> blames the woman. And then, he, and, then, and then he goes, that you put here. <laughs> it gets worse than blaming the woman. He's like, her fault, but really more your fault. I didn't have any problem until she came along. You also didn't have nobody to talk to, buddy. You didn't have anybody to cook for you. You didn't have anything. You were just walking around going, what am I going to do today? You know, The woman that you put here, she gave me some fruit from the tree and, and I ate it. Adam almost makes it look like Eve held him down and just shoved it in his mouth. And the Lord God said to the woman, what is this that you have done? The woman said, the serpent deceived me, and I ate. She passes the buck. The serpent deceived. It's true. It's true. But I don't think that when we get to eternity, if God has questions for us, we're going to be able to say, the devil made me do it. You know what I'm saying? God's going to say, look, I understand that there was a force that was, that was, that was rallied against you. 
I understand that there was a, an accuser of the brethren. I, I understand that there was a tempter. But I also know that I sent my Holy Spirit to planet Earth. I, spent, I, I, I sent the counselor to you. I sent the comforter to you. I sent that help to you. I sent that central intelligence agent to you that kind of puts the hairs up on the back of your neck to tell you, hey, this ain't right. Get out of here. I sent that to you as well. And so it's not as though you were without help. It's not as though you were by yourself. It's not as though you didn't have somebody speaking to you. You had somebody speaking to you the whole time. I don't think it's going to be good enough to say the devil made me do it when we get into eternity with God. But that's exactly what Eve says right here. The serpent deceived me and, and I ate. So the Lord God, what does God deal with first? Does he deal with humanity first or does he deal with the devil first? God is always in your favor. This shows that God is always for you right here because the first thing that he deals with is the devil. The Lord God said to the serpent, because you have done this, curse you above all livestock, all wild animals, you will crawl on your belly and you will eat dust all the days of your life. Then he deals with the devil and he deals with humanity in verse 15. This is the first time we see Jesus show up in scripture. Genesis chapter 3 Verse 15 is the first time God tells us his plan for what's going to happen later on in the New Testament. I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your offspring and hers. And here it is. He will crush your head and you will strike his heel. In other words, he is going to crush you under his work but you're going to, it's going to look like you drew blood. If you remember, I don't know if you've watched The Passion of the Christ. I love that Mel Gibson included this scene where the, where the snake is crawling along the ground and Jesus in his sandal, you know, it's like a Birkenstock. Jesus, Jesus is wearing his sandals and all of a sudden that snake is by him and he just lifts his foot and he just stomps the head of that snake as hard as he possibly can. That's Genesis chapter 3, verse 15. He deals with the devil first and he tells man his plan for humanity there's going to be redemption that comes out of this for you and for me. I'm going to deal with the devil. There's going to be no redemption for him. He caused the fall. He was the tempter. He is the accuser. He's the mad guy in the story. And I'm going to deal with him first. But there's going to be redemption for you down the road. Mercy shows up. Listen, some people say, you know what? The Old Testament doesn't have any grace in it whatsoever. Verse 15 of Genesis chapter 3 is telling us that grace is going to come. That grace is going to happen. It's going to be there. Now he gets back to Eve. He's like, but we're not done here. Because realistically, sin never pays off. Does it? Come on, man. I know some of us did it. Some of us did it well. Some of, some of us got into it deep. It always delivers less than what it promises, doesn't it? And here's what happens for eating a piece of fruit. I'm telling you, fruit is evil. Watch what happens. <laughs> Pastor said fruit was evil. To the woman, he says, I'm going to greatly increase your pains in childbearing. Next time you're looking at an apple, go, was it worth it? With pain, you will give birth to children. Can I get an amen from the ladies? Your desire will be for your husband and he will rule over you. To Adam, he said. Because you listened to your wife and ate from the tree about which I commanded you that you must not eat of it, cursed is the ground because of you. Through painful toil, you will eat of it all the days of your life. You're going to work it. And it's going to produce thorns and thistles for you, and you will eat the plants of the field. By the sweat of your brow, you will eat your food. Remember, in the Garden of Eden, there really wasn't any work, man. They just went around and just kind of hung out all day. It wasn't, it wasn't like it is now. It wasn't, it wasn't eight, you know, five days a week, eight hours a day, or for some of you, like six, 12. It wasn't that, no. The food was there, you know. It was there. They just hung out. You're going to sweat from your brow. You're going to eat your food until you return to the ground. Because remember, I made you from dirt. I didn't speak you into existence. And so back to the ground, you're going to return because from dust you were taken and to dust you will you'll return. In other words, God told you, you're going to die. And now I'm telling you, you're going to die. God didn't just mean that they were going to die physically. He also meant spiritually. There was going to be a spiritual death as well. That that spirit man was going to become separated from God. But he also did mean you are also, in the physical sense, going to, to die. 
And, and, and we know that, we know from the first law of thermodynamics, like the moment we're born, we start to, we, we go through life and we actually have it, there's a whole cycle and we actually start to break down. Our bodies start to break down. And why? Because from the dust we were taken and the whole process of life is, is returning back to the dust from which we were taken. That's, that's, that's the arc of life. That's a sad way to think about it, Pastor. That's the reality of life. We got so many fake knees, fake hips, fake... We got some, some, some of y'all can't get through an airport. That's the way life goes from the dust you were taken and to the dust you'll return. Why? Because at the end of the day, there was a simple directive from God and it was ignored. It was ignored, but it was also enticed to be ignored. That still happens today. God gives us directives. God speaks to us through the power of the Holy Spirit. God gives us clarity on where we're supposed to go, who we're supposed to talk to, what we're supposed to say, how we're supposed to act. He'll tell us the good things that we're supposed to do and the evil that we're supposed to stay away from. We're not always good at listening to the directives because there's also enticement. Those things promise to give away more than they ever give away. And there's still an enemy of our soul who still says, you know what, did God really say that? Is is it really going to cause harm in your life? Is it really going to be bad for your marriage? Is it really going to hurt your kids? Is it really going to hurt your body physically? Is it really, did God really mean that? Did God really mean, like, let's just get down to it. Did God really mean for this reason, shall a man leave his mother and his father that the two shall become one flesh? And God says that marriage is between one man and one woman. It's just what it says in scripture. Don't shoot the messenger, but that's the message. Did God really say that? Is that what he really meant or is love just love? How do we get there, pastor? How in the world are you getting on that? I'm saying this is how it still works. He still will cause us to look at things and go, is that what that really means? Or is that just pastor's interpretation? Have you heard that before? Well, that's your, that's your interpretation of scripture. You know, bless the Lord. That's your interpretation of scripture. I read it and I get something different. If you get something different out of the same word, listen, I believe in a rhema word. I believe in a living word. I believe the Holy Spirit can speak to you and bring revelation where you've had none before. But there's also the logos word, the written word, the black and white word that God in his infinite mercy never changes because he is the same yesterday, today, and forever. I will go to the grave believing this. The fairest thing that God ever did is he doesn't move the target. It's harder to hit a moving target, is it not? It is harder to hit a moving target. Now, some of you guys can miss a deer with a slug from 40 yards away, but don't go skeet shooting if you can't hit a deer that's that close. You know what I'm saying? I'm just saying it's harder in general to hit a moving. God made it never move. The path that leads to heaven, it's the same. It's well-worn. It's straight and it's narrow, but it's the same path. There is no other name under heaven given, to, given unto man by which we can be saved. It's still Jesus and Jesus only. Well, what about all these other gods? Listen, man, if you're going into a city and there's only one road and everybody's going the same and there's no wrecks along that road, straight shot. It's like driving down to the Florida Keys. There's one road in, one road out. As long as everybody minds their business and stays in their lane, you're going to get down to whatever key you want to go to. It's when people try to veer to the left or to the right that they cause a log jam. And in churches, we're veering to the left and veering to the Well, maybe it means this. Well, maybe it means this. Well, maybe it means this. Man, you're just muddying up the water, the people that want to go straight. That's what you're doing. God's target never moves. That's the fairest. That's grace. It's grace that it doesn't shift. It's grace that it doesn't move. Thank God it doesn't move. But man, we still act the same. We do. <laughs> I've got to say, we still really act the same. Things just, the way we, we respond. Like, for example, I, the, 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 the title of this, this message today is called Misery Loves Company. Think about this. You ever heard anybody say it's lonely at the top? No? Just me? You've heard it. Come on, let me... You've heard it said before. You've heard people say, you know what? It's lonely at the top. What they're saying is sometimes when you have success, there's nobody else up there with you. 
Now, you didn't get up there by yourself, but sometimes in that rarefied air where you happen to be the boss, there's times even as a boss, you don't want the buck to stop with you. You're like, I wish I could roll this on uphill a little bit, let it go to somebody else. But sometimes the buck does stop there, and that's what they're talking about. Sometimes when you got to make a decision, and when that storm of, 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 of awfulness has arrived at you, somebody's coming to you and saying, I need you to deal with this. There's nobody above you to deal with it, okay? Now, we know as believers, there's always one to take it to, isn't there? There's always one to go to for wisdom, and there's, there's one above you always that you can take it to. There's times where leadership is lonely, right? Because leadership is nothing more than influence. And if, you are, if you're leading people and, and nobody's following, you're not leading anybody you're just taking a walk leadership is influence people have to follow you but you have to be out front and sometimes you're out there by yourself everybody else is like what way we need to go that's how it worked for Moses Moses started off among the people then he got out in front of the people and then on the Mount Sinai he was above the people leadership works that way as you climb the level of leadership it gets lonelier and lonelier and lonelier it really does sometimes being the lead pastor of the church man I'd rather just be a greeter I would there's times I would because Oftentimes, leadership is lonely. It's a lonely spot. But I'm going to tell you right now, misery loves company. If you think about some of the, the dirtiest deeds you got into, was there somebody else involved? Can I get an amen? There's always somebody else involved. When you were drinking, did you like drinking alone? No, I like drinking with people. Because I like to say smart things. No, I don't know what, what was going on. But you, you did. There was somebody to talk to. Well, you know, you did it with people. I'm, I'm just going to say it the way it is. Most sexual sin involves other people. I, 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 I think with Adam and Eve, it was very clear. Eve was like, you know what? I'm not going to do this by myself. He should eat this. Let's go over here. Taste this, it's delicious. You know what's weird? What's weird to me is like after Adam ate, they finally discovered they were naked. Like you'd have thought Eve would have been like, oh my. I'm not gonna go look at Adam right now. No, first thing she did was, you know what? This was nice. I liked it. Misery loves company. Adam didn't deny that he ate the fruit. He did say, I ate it. I mean, he blamed first, right? But he's like, yeah, yeah. I, I, think, I think, honestly, if I could be just Adam in the moment, I'd be like, God, if you've seen her, you made her really pretty, and I had to do it. Because typically, when we get into trouble, trouble's always got company. It's always got company. There's always somebody else involved. We're, all, we're, we're never, never alone. We're just always with somebody. I, I, pe people, that, people that have struggled with drugs, they'll end up in a trap house because there's people there. You know, and at least, at least if this goes sideways, maybe, maybe there'll be somebody. That, there's so many instances that I, like you get into arguments and you say something you shouldn't say. Unless you're arguing in a mirror with yourself. You probably said something you shouldn't say to somebody else. Now you got to go apologize. They got to apologize. There's a stalemate. Nobody wants to apologize. The thing that you don't want to do is the thing that would solve the problem. So you continue to be miserable, loving the company. You know, there's times I'll fight with my wife and, and, and we'll apologize. And she, she, I shouldn't even, she'll look at me, she'll go, there's nobody else I'd rather fight with. I'm like, what does that mean? I'm not sure what that means, but okay. We, we, we get into things together. We have not changed. Since Genesis, we have not changed. It, 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 taste this. Look at this. Listen to this. Let's do this. We do it still. And then once it goes sideways... Well, whose fault is it really? Who, who really is to blame here? And we go down that path. Come on, think about some of the worst, most diabolical arguments that you had with your spouse. If you're not married, just wait, it'll happen. <laughs> your blessing's coming. But think about it. We yell at our kids because our kids start off, she did it first. He did it first. And then you get married acting like you're better and you're yelling at your kids and you're like, well, it's really his fault. He did it first. 
You were the first one that said this. Remember what you said? Remember what you... Woman, that was eight weeks ago. I don't... And actually, in my relationship, I'm the one with the long memory. She's the one with the short memory. She's like, I can't remember what I said yesterday. I'm like, oh, let me tell you, verbatim. I, ha I actually have it here on my dictaphone. Let me play it back for you. <laughs> it's bad. It's not good. You know, she's like, I hate arguing with you. And then she tells me after it's over, there's nobody else. I'd rather... I don't know what to say. But whose fault is it really? And that's kind of where, that's the path we go. The man said, the woman you put here with me, she gave me some fruit from the tree and I ate it. And the Lord God said to the woman, what is this have you done? The woman said, well, the devil made me do it. The serpent, you, he deceived me and I ate. And this is where we differentiate between other pack animals. We're blamers. You know, have you ever seen a gazelle say, you know what, you got, you got Bob killed. But with that line, you, you stumbled. And Bob got killed, that lion caught him because you just didn't know which direction to go. We're the, we rationalize. It, you know, it, it's one of our greatest strengths, but it's one of our greatest weaknesses. We'll rationalize our way out of sin. We'll rationalize, rationalize blame. We'll make it everybody else's fault. You did this, and if you hadn't done this, I wouldn't have done that. You know, if you hadn't cut me off, I wouldn't have chased you for the last 20 miles in my car, acting like a maniac with my Jesus sticker on the back of my car. That never would have happened if you hadn't done that. Maybe that person just didn't see you. Have you ever pulled out in front of somebody, and God's honest truth is you just didn't see them? A man was just convicted for shooting somebody in Ohio and killing a man with road rage. It happens. What are we getting so... People literally put apps on their phone that's gunfire. Have you seen that? There's an app that just... That like they'll drive by people they're mad at and the phone just makes gun noises because they ain't really going to shoot something. What is wrong with you? Who developed that app? There's an app for that. There should not be an app for that. <laughs> Who is really to blame? Second service is going to be so much weaker. None of this is in my notes. <laughs> I'm going to forget it all. But the reality is we do the exact same thing. Whose fault is it? Whose fault is it? Even in our best relationships when things don't go right, well, whose fault is it really? Here's the reality. When both of you make the mistake, it's both of your faults. It's just really that simple. Your kids get in a fight, and both of them are fighting back with each other. I don't care who started it. What I want to see is who's going to be the one to solve it. I want to see the one that's going to make the first step. You know, in marriages, that's really the way it should be. It doesn't matter who started it. Who's going to be the big boy or the big girl and say, you know what, I'm going to take the first step to make it right. I'm going to, I'm going to say the words that I don't want to say, but I know will calm the situation. You know, I'm sorry does a whole lot more than it was your fault. Or, or you know what, let's just talk about this. And I, I don't want to fight. I just, I just want to be right with you. That's, but you don't want to, you, like, come on, just keep it real. Sometimes you just don't want to say those words. You got to vent. You could call it venting. I'm just venting. I'm blowing off steam. If I don't, I'll explode. What are you, a boiler? Like, some, sometimes, sometimes it's taking the first step and saying, you know what, I might not have been... I might not have been the party that started the offense, but somewhere along the line I got engaged in the offense. And so I'm going to take the step to solve the problem. Whose fault is it? Is it really? Blame seems to matter, but does blame always matter? Does it always matter who started it? Like, do, do, when you're not the one that started it, does the argument feel better ultimately? It really doesn't. What always feels good is the solution. What always, what always brings peace is the solution. Not the argument. But that's the way we're, we like to say, that's the way we're wired. You know what? God's challenging your wiring. He's giving you the Holy Spirit to be rewired. To follow a different path. To follow wisdom. So here's the question. If we sin together, we blame each other, the last logical question that you have to ask yourself is where are you leading people when you fail and when you fall and you stumble and you trip and you do things that you shouldn't do? What do you do with it? How do you lead out of that situation? Very easy to blame the devil. I, I'll, give, I, 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 I'll give this statement. There are times he has a part to play. God's already dealt with him. 
He's already dealt with him. When the Holy Spirit convicts you, the Holy Spirit's trying to deal with you. So saying things like, you know what, I just fell, you know, I, 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 it's the devil's fault. God's like, you know what, I already dealt with him. It's over for him. Like you've read the end of the book, he's, he's finished. But I'm here to deal with you. Because God is a relational God, right? And God's saying, you know what? He's giving you a path when he convicts you. He's giving you the path to problem solving, isn't he? He's saying, I didn't cause the problem. I didn't start the fight. But the Holy Spirit's coming to make the relationship between you and him right. And he's saying, man, if you just talk with me and you just confess it though your sins be as scarlet he'll make them white as snow though your path started off crooked he'll make it straight and he'll make it narrow and he'll illuminate it even though you have a gap between you and God I'm sorry Lord I failed there's nobody else to blame but me I did this God closes the gap. That's what the blood of Jesus does. Amen. That's what grace does. It closes the gap between you and God, the fissure that our actions create. There's times I forget that. There's times I feel like, man, there's nothing God could ever do to forgive me. There's nothing. Come on, if you've ever felt that before, I just, I've gone too far. I've failed too much. I've said too much. I've acted too, too poorly. I've done things I shouldn't have done. I, I, I've hurt people. I've, I, God could never close the gap. God's, God's going, man, you've got a narrative of my word that's just not in there. There's that scripture again, that, that idea that my holiness somehow is what makes me achieve his plan for my life and the reality is is my righteousness is nothing more than filthy rags i've always needed jesus i'm always going to need jesus today and tomorrow and forevermore i'm going to need jesus i'm going to have to kneel at the foot of the cross many times over in my relationship i'm going to have to be renewed by the washing of his word many times over in my walk with him because that's how relationship works it's not a matter of who's at fault it's a matter of who takes the first step. And I would submit to you that on the cross, Jesus always took the first step. Well, what about the future? Jesus took the first step. What about, what about when I get in an argument? with Jesus took the first step. What about road, road rage? I got Jesus took the first step. Jesus always took the first step because that's what a leader looks like. So what about in your marriage? What about in your friendships? What about in your relationships? How, how do you lead? Do you blame other people? When misery has loved company, do you blame other people? Well, if they hadn't been here, I'd have never done that. You sure you wouldn't have find, found somebody else? You sure you, wouldn't have, you sure you wouldn't have gone down that road? It would have just, there would have just been a different face there. I, I, would have never, I would have never made that decision. Yeah, but you did. You did make that decision. You did do that thing. And if you did do that thing, is blaming other people going to solve anything at all? See, here's the thing about leadership. I told you earlier, leadership is influence. It's nothing more. It's nothing less. It's your ability to get people to follow you. You want to know what I love about God? Is he allows you to choose where you lead them. There are leaders, gifted, call them NBLs, natural born leaders, they didn't work for it. They just, they're, they're charismatic. They're, they're the type of people that you go, I don't know what it is, but there's a magnetism to that person. It's not necessarily because of looks or anything like that, but man, I want to hear what they have to say. Those people, those people are natural born leaders and they can lead people to the cross or they can lead people away from the cross. In your marriage, you can lead your, your, your family toward the cross or you can lead them away from the cross. You can, you can be honest and you can say, you know what, I, I, I failed and I, I want to show you what grace looks like. I want to show you what humility looks like and I want to show you how, what it looks like to, to, to get right with God after you've messed up. And you can lead your family back toward the cross. You can lead your friends toward the cross, but you can lead them away too. Influence goes both ways. You can influence people toward, you can influence people away. That's the problem with Adam and Eve. Both of them were influential to one another, were they not? Both of them were. Both of them wielded influence with the other. You know why? Because there was nobody else to wield influence with. They were the only two people on planet Earth. What she said mattered to him. What he said mattered to her. And a decision was made. 
in my influence, I'm going to do something that I was told not to do. And now because I'm miserable, I want some company and I'm going to lead away from what God told us to do. And now all of humanity, because there was only two, now all of humanity has fallen as a result. It's amazing the ripple effect of small decisions. You and I have to come to church because of fruit. I'm just saying, think about it. Next time you want a banana. You wouldn't even need church. You, you might come together and hang out with one another. Humanity would have probably gathered together and we would have lived together and had community with one another. But the reality is we would still be operating under one rule. Everything's fine, just don't eat out of that tree. I'm, like, I'm cutting that sucker down. Let's get the chainsaw. Decisions have ripple effects. Things we do affect other people. I'm not telling you this because I haven't ran through God's voice and worried about how it affects other people. I've done it too. God says, don't do this. And I'm like, I'm going to do what I want to do. I've done it too. But I've also experienced what it's like to say, well, you know what? It's because of this. It's because of that. You know what? And I do believe, I do believe that our past influences our present and there's things that have happened to people that, that they don't know why they, they make the decisions that they make. But I also know that there's help out there to break that stuff off of you and break that stuff off of your life. There's, there's a Holy Spirit that wants to break chains. There's a God that wants to set free, set the captive completely free. He doesn't just want to for, forgive you. He wants to take the key of the shackle that's on you and he wants to take it clean off. So that, that no longer is a reason to continue down the path that you were walking. Pastor Joshua, you can come. Is that how you want to respond? So see, you can throw the baby out with the bathwater and say, you know what, I only read the New Testament because there's redemption in the New Testament. But the Old Testament has redemption in it as well. The Old Testament has prophecy clear back from Genesis chapter 3, verse 15, showing that Jesus was coming, showing that there was a path back to have right relationship with God, showing that God could reconcile and restore relationships. Adam and Eve reconciled. Their relationship was okay. They made babies after this. They populated the earth after this, even though they broke down what God wanted intentionally or orig originally for his plan for humanity. God created a path back to relationship for the two of them. They were reconciled unto God. He put a process in place. God was the first one. Think about this. When they realized they were naked, what did God do? He killed an animal. He shed blood. And in a very real kind of metaphorical sense, he covered them with a sacrifice, did he not? He put skin of animals over top. He was showing them, Jesus is going to do this. Eventually, there's going to be a once and for all sacrifice. Though you were naked in your sin, I'm the one that's willing to make the sacrifice to cover you. And this sacrifice is not going to be lasting and it's not going to be good enough. Eventually, Genesis chapter 3, verse 15, one is coming who will do this once and for all. There'll be no more need for sacrifice. There'll be no need for shedding of innocent blood anymore because the one that comes to wash you and cover you, he will do it completely. He will do it thoroughly and not just for you, but anybody who calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Clear back in Genesis chapter 3, verse 15, grace is right there hanging out right after they failed. Right after they failed. You can't throw the baby out with the bathwater. The Old Testament has no relevance. The Old Testament's the reason the New Testament exists. It's the plan of God. It's the arrow. It's the compass that points to the future. Listen. I'm not saying that how you handle things in the flesh is going to change. What I'm saying is you have the Holy Spirit living on the inside of you that God wants you to let challenge your flesh. Don't do what you feel like doing right now. Try this. Say this, 
act this way. Come on, I, I don't know about you. I've been in arguments before and God says, I know, I, I'm, I'm going to tell you what would end this. And you're like, shh, I got something else to say. I'll say that after this. God's like, don't say that. The hole's going to get deeper. Put the shovel down, son. Put the shovel down. Put the, I'm giving you a ladder. Put the shovel down. I smacked the Holy Spirit with the shovel. <laughs> Is that what you want to do? Get in right relationship with people. You know what? This is what church is good for. Rather than sinning together, we have the opportunity to pursue God together. We have the opportunity to come together in community and sharpen each other. The Bible says iron sharpens iron, so one man sharpens uh, uh, another. That an enemy multiplies kisses, but faithful are the wounds of a, a friend. We have the ability to lift each other up, to edify one another, to encourage e each other, to spur one another on toward good works. It's what we're here to do. And isn't it funny when we fall into sin, this is often the community that we push away from first. Because for a minute, misery loves company. It's your choice. Let's stand to our feet. I want to pray for you today. Heavenly Father, we thank you. Man, thank you, God. Thank you for reminding me. Thank you for reminding me how immediate grace is after failure, how fast it's available. God, literally one or two verses apart from one another. You deal with the serpent. You deal with Eve. But man, first you tell, you tell the devil and you let humanity know that one is coming that's going to crush the head of the serpent. You quickly cover them in the skins of animals, making a sacrifice for them. They have no idea what's going on other than you're covering their nakedness, but you're showing them that there's going to be a covering in their life. For everything that ever happens, there's going to be a covering in their life. You're showing us, Lord, that we don't have to fail once and then that sets off a pattern of failure in our life. We have the opportunity immediately to turn to grace, to turn to forgiveness, to turn to the blood of Christ. And Lord Jesus, that is mercy at its finest. Thank you, God, for not moving the target, for not moving the goalposts, but for those goalposts staying in the same place. Now, we can... We can act like interpretation of scripture has changed or there's some ancient text that we didn't see or some, some weird Greek word that we can, we can do that all day long. But Lord, reality is you never move the goalpost. You never move the target. Thank you for that. Thank you. That's grace. That's mercy. Lord Jesus, we are so grateful, so humbled by how much you love us and how little oftentimes we deserve it. Every head bowed, every eye closed. Do you need to receive the grace and the mercy of Jesus today? Man, some of you, some of you the, the biggest way to respond to this, some of you might be right now, you might, you might be in an argument. You're, you're, at current, you're at church, but you are currently entrenched in a fight with somebody right now. And man, at different times, you've wanted to take the step and you've wanted to make it right. You've wanted to make the phone call. You wanted to have the conversation, but you have not let yourself. You have not let the Holy Spirit, you smacked the Holy Spirit with the shovel in the bottom of the hole and said, you know what? I'm just going to stay down here. Is it, is it fun in the bottom of that hole? You know what? The Holy Spirit's dealing with you right now. Some of you, there's a phone call you need to make when you leave this place. A mom or dad that you haven't talked to in a couple years. You, need, well, you don't know what they did. I don't need to know what they did. I I know what Jesus did on the cross so that you could make that phone call. Listen, don't live life broken when you have a God that died to make you whole. Every head bowed. If you would say, you know what, pastor, I need to get right with Jesus today. Because I, like Adam and Eve, have done some things that God told me not to do. And I feel naked. I feel exposed in a spiritual sense. And you want to know that God is covering you today. Put your hand up all around the room and say, that's me, if that describes you. Thank you. Thank you. Amen. Amen. If you would say, you know what, Pastor? I feel like, I feel like my relationship with the Lord is good. But I know that it could be better because there are some relationships in my life that aren't good. And I know that. And there's some people that I have iced over, that I have pushed away. 
And I know that the Lord is dealing with me right now on that. And I need wisdom. I need wisdom from the Holy Spirit on how to handle that. I've spent my time blaming and maybe they are most at fault, but I, I, want, to be a, I, I want to be responsible for the solution. I, I want nobody looking around because this, this part is intensely personal. If you have a relationship like that, that you know is like that, and you want it to be right, and you want the Lord to give you wisdom on how to solve it, not how to make it worse. And you want to pray about that today. Put your hand up right now and say, that's me all around the room. Amen, 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 amen. Man, let's go before the Lord today. Let's trust him. Let's hand this to him rather than turn it over to the enemy. Before I pray, I want to let you know this. Every week, if you need further prayer, if you need to talk to somebody, if you need to have an elder pray with you, my elders are going to be available. My prayer partners are going to be available. After service, we would love to spend some time with you one-on-one -on -one and pray with you. We can always go deeper. So they'll work their way to the front. If you need to, after I say amen, come to the front. But let's pray together right now. Lord Jesus, we thank you that you are the one who who takes the ashes of our life and you have the ability to make beauty from those ashes. What the enemy meant for evil, you're able to turn it into good. That's powerful. Lord Jesus, we just haven't given you out the opportunity to take what the enemy has meant for evil and turn it into good. We have to allow you to do that. We have to stop digging. We have to stop fighting. We have to put the arrows down. We have to, we have to stop going to war with people who are made in your image. And so right now, Lord Jesus, I ask that you would give us wisdom from heaven on how to handle our emotions, how to handle those things, how to stop shifting blame or blaming other people and say, you know what, I might have had a part to play in this, but I want to I get to the solution. I don't want to keep fighting. I don't want to keep arguing. I don't want this thing to stay broken. I pray right now, Father, that you would speak through the power of your Holy Spirit on how to handle it. And the simplest way we know, Lord, is to get into the Word and put Scripture on it. Put Scripture on the situation. I pray, Lord, that we would have the ability to return anger with kindness. That we would have the ability to turn harsh words into kind words, loving words, words that will change the atmosphere of the situation. Father, we give it to you right now. Church, I'm going to ask that you pray this with me. Dear Jesus, Dear Jesus I, give you my heart today. I give you my heart today. The deepest part of me. Part of me. I, have I have failed. I've sinned. I've sinned. And like Adam and, Eve, like Adam and Eve, there's been other people to blame. But Lord, today, I take personal responsibility for the things that I've done. And I ask you today, Jesus, to forgive me of my sins to wash me clean and to make me whole today Jesus I give you all of me so I can have all of you and I pray it in Jesus name Amen Father be with my friends as they go bless them and keep them I pray Lord that you would use them as salt and light a city that's set upon a hill that cannot be hidden in Jesus name Amen, Amen. God bless you as you go We'll see you next week for third part in our series, Oldies But Goodies. If you need to pray, we'll be up here for that as well.